right, so we're here with Caesar Wake at uh, Stano Pass. What's going on, guys? How you doing, man? So, uh, home home show, local show, Stano yep. Pass. Yep. You ever played here before? Yeah, I gotta say this is probably it's the tenth time we played here. Tenth time. <laughs> yeah, just, we're 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 quite local to here, so is it's, any, it's a popular uh, spot. Are these the, the biggest bands you've played for, or here at this venue? Yeah. Tonight show, yeah. or this is a, a pretty big show. Um, in terms of like you know, bigger tours and whatnot. I'm trying to think of a, a bigger tour that we've. Well, you mean specific to Stanhope, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You played. You played Mayhem. Yeah, we played Mayhem in 2012. I think it was the year before they they shut down, mm. or maybe two years before. So which band? It was at the. Uh, yeah, headliners the headliners? At the, it was Slipknot actually. Uh, Asking Alexandria. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I'm like, yeah. was it the Asking Alexandria one? Yeah, it was a good I don't time. Know, they, they got. They got. They kind of got off the bands that I particularly listen to. In no. the beginning, I'm like, oh great, you know, I got In Flames, Killstreak Engage, yeah. and now you have these bands there, you know. Well, that's the, the cool thing about metal, at least what I think the cool thing about metal is there's so many bands nowadays that um, you can encompass under the genre of metal. You know, you have um, metal bands like uh, Animals as Leader, uh, uh, Animals as Leaders in Periphery, and you have metal bands like Killswitch Engage and, and then Slipknot. Um, there's so many different characteristics of certain bands that you can consider what would be under the umbrella of metal nowadays it's such a broad and, and all-encompassing genre it's crazy with when you get into the you know technical you know genres Sub -genres. you have melodic metal death metal and then you have progressive you have all this all this crap like and that's rock and that's metal like you have it's just a, like a huge web of like different styles yeah and the thing that i think a lot of people misunderstand about mayhem and, and these massive metal tours is that they're still it's it's a it's a business you yeah. know so well that's also why they shut down and uh, yeah <laughs> it's, you, you know they're, they're gonna do what they have to do to get the the, the large audience oh, out. i mean not like i don't like asking alexandra or bands like that it's it's just when you grow up going to Mayhem with these types of bands and then they switch it, you're like, oh, maybe I don't want to go this year. You yeah, know? you have a little personal disappointment, but you got to understand that there's other fans out oh, there. Oh, exactly. Wanna, you know? And hey, if it's going to make metal money, I'm all for it. You right. know, I exactly. want metal to be like the dominating, you know, genre. Genre. In, exactly. In the entire world. Well, the cool thing, too, is, you know, I think metal is kind of making a little bit of a comeback into the mainstream. You know, back in the 90s, you had, you know, pop music, R&B, and then slowly you know out of the 80s when you had rock stars like you know guns and roses those were the, the real rock stars of um you know what you would consider metal but you know alternative rock heavy rock and then as we get into the 2000s you you start to get um rappers are actually what you you know you you hear people calling rappers the new rock stars of music so i think it's it's kind of cool that um i'm starting to see a lot more metal bands come to the forefront of of what i would consider almost like a metal revival um, especially in New Jersey, you know, there's a lot of acts, uh, Tooth Grinder, Dillinger Escape Plan. Um, even if you go back into the 2000s, My Chemical Romance, when they came out of um, New Jersey, uh, I could, you, I wouldn't really consider it a hotbed hotbed, but it, it is cool seeing, you know, big names getting out of there from the state. So let's, I want to ask you a question about Mayhem. What was it like playing that? That was phenomenal. I mean, we, we had uh, fortunately won a Battle of the Bands to get onto that. Um, which That's is awesome, what I wanted to know. You know, awesome uh, response from our, our fans that came out to, you know, help, essentially give us help, give us the win. And we go out there and it was one of those days of the summer that was brutally hot. And we got there really early, like 11, 12 o'clock was like peak hotness. So we got like all kind of cold water and whatnot. And so aside from it being like, in, like incredibly hot on stage and, and sweating and whatnot. It was, so now, was which, which uh, did you play all of them? All the mayhem shows. It, like, it was just one date. It was just we one played date? the one date. It was um up in New England, right? It was Camden, Camden, New Jersey. It was Camden. Yeah. So we. Okay. Yes, the the battle that we had won landed us on that one specific show. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible time. Okay, so in case anybody wants to stalk you, where do you guys live in Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Jefferson Township. Oh, all right, so you're yeah. real close. So I live um, actually five minutes down the road. I, I live over in Mount Arlington, Roxbury Township. Okay. And then a um, couple of our other members, we have um, Anthony, our guitarist. He lives over in, um, I believe it's by Bloomfield. I want to say the township is... Oh, so that's um, kind of far. Yeah, it's a little far. It's about a 45-minute drive. And then mm -hmm. our other guitarist uh bill and our drummer uh, rick is uh they're over in newton which is actually a little bit north of here but yeah. we all practice in um rockaway at backroom studios oh um, yeah we know where that is yep owned by kevin and Treasian, mm -hmm. uh who's actually playing guitar for dillinger escape plan right now and it's always a pleasure to uh, to work around him and and to he actually recorded our record as well 
You know, it's funny. I, I was on on YouTube, uh, not YouTube, uh, Facebook. You guys posted the Mortal Kombat video, and I'm sitting there. I'm looking. <laughs> I'm like, that parking lot looks familiar. Is that back room? Have you been uh, over there? Yeah, I've, uh, my one band, Too Far Lost, to record our album with uh, John. Jonathan. Good job. Dude, yeah. he is he is awesome, awesome, awesome yeah. dude. He's young too. A lot of people look at him. Yeah, like, dude, it's it's crazy to think. I'm like, I'm sitting here, and they're like, oh yeah, that's uh, Dillinger Escape Plan's guitar. I just left it here. I'm like, <laughs> all right, we could record our album with that. Sure, that's that's nice. We've actually been lucky enough um, to meet them. To, to 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 meet them, but we've been lucky enough that we've actually our practice schedule just so happened to to kind of coincide with Dillinger they were actually there a couple of times practicing and that's always you know a really eye-opening experience to watch them practice and, and watch them do what they do because um, it's really an intimate setting they actually played a show in the live room at Backroom which I see they do that a lot they do you know it's it's only a capacity of maybe about 50 or 60 people and you have a hundred people crammed into that space <laughs> it's it's really a very intimate experience to, to see a band like that who goes out on an international um, an international and they're level pretty big level, yeah. Yeah. they've been on mayhem yeah well dude it's it's funny to think that a band like that is practicing in our home state in a place that we've obviously been to that goes back though there's actually if you were to YouTube uh, Dillinger's Miss Machine album there's footage on there of I believe Greg doing the vocals in the practice space that we that we practice in at Backroom so I mean they've they're just uh, that's like their stomping ground there and Kevin's known uh, Ben for years and it's one of those things where there's, they just know them forever. <laughs> How many nights a week do you guys practice? Depends on our show scheduling and whatnot. You know, if we have something like this coming up, um, our drummer is actually on tour filling in for another band right now. So we have a friend of ours filling in for us. And so we've actually been in, I'm the singer, so like I'm not like, I'm, I'm like the lead singer disease guy, I've never showing up. But I, I was there, you know, two or three times in the past two weeks, but these guys are just phenomenal. They're in there, what were you guys in there? Five days a week five days a week in the past yeah. for the past two three weeks our, our normal practice schedule though like we all have you know jobs that we have to, to really use to um, to fund what we to do what of we course, love of course of course yep but we um we normally on a normal a normal week um on a week-to-week -week basis we try to be down there at least two days a week at awesome. very minimum and you are you there the two days a week or yeah or no? yeah for you the most are, part yeah you are okay yeah. well I, I do you do you write i said what i said i was like i this, this past week was like Monday. We had the show coming up, and it seems like yeah. this time of year, of course, everyone starts to get sick. It just so happens when we have a big show like this, like I had to play a battle of the bands with you know vocal issues because of uh, you know, strep or whatever you want to call it. And I also we played a show at Starline Ballroom with all the remains, and I had to, I was sick, and I was like, what the heck is you going know, on? You, you so I started to get sick this week as well, and thankfully it's, I got over it. It's true, and you know a lot of times even in in, in dance band, um, the singer will just he'll skip it. You know you got to kind of practice. preserve. I'll never forget it's, it's you, you saying that sparked the story I'm going to tell you. We went to Starland. I forget who we were going to see. It was probably Killswitch. The the singer of this one band actually got up on the microphone. He's like, I have the stomach flu. He's like, if I yak all over you, he's like, I'm truly sorry. Yeah. And that's actually when it kind of like just opened my eyes a little bit to how you just need to put up with shit. You got to get out there and you got to get on stage and you got to do what you do you if that's do what it. you want to do. I mean, there's actually a lot of people who, like you said, they will just cancel their show just to save. Not a lot everybody's of singers, Axl Rose, like, though. But then there's like <laughs> Adele and uh, it's not, I think the singer Papa Roach, like they actually get polyps on their vocal cords for pushing their throat, you know? Yeah. Like at the All That Remains show, I ended up I ended up doing a half hour set, 45 minutes or whatever it was, and I did kind of the same thing that singer was. I told the crowd that, listen, like I'm sick, but half of you are probably sick too, and you're all out here having fun, and everyone went crazy, and it was. Yeah, that was yeah. a good time as well. Good looking out. Yeah, it's yeah. good attitude. Yeah, you gotta be positive. And I, I mean, you know, some vocalists do get a really bad rep for um, not participating, not contributing, um, sort of like the the prima donna. But I, I will I'll, say that Sean is that. Sean is actually um, a very good band member. Yeah. Um, he does contribute. He does show up. He, you know, he he pays his part. Um, obviously, if we're practicing five days a, uh, five days in a row, um, we don't expect him to sing all five it, days in a exactly. row. Exactly. I think it, you have to. You know, the instruments have to be down more than the vocals, so to speak. You know. Yeah. I mean, do we, you write though? Yeah, I write. Yeah, I write. Um, in terms of practicing with shows and whatnot. 
I would say that if, if you're on a tour schedule where you're going to be playing back-to-back -back dates, which mm -hmm. is very common with a lot of touring musicians, that's when I would be there practicing night after night to, to get yeah. the, because they say the, mo the, the vocal cords is actually like a muscle. And you have to it treat is. it like like the gym, where you're going every day and getting getting it used to. You what's... look like you spend a couple of days a week in the gym. Yeah, I mean, I spent this. I, I sat <laughs> on stage. Both do actually. <laughs> this cute guy over here. We used to be workout partners. We used to be, and then you got busy with college. And is that how you met? Uh, how do we we met because of the band? Well, um, uh, interesting enough, um, I used to play guitar. I played guitar for about 15 years, and um, in another band or by myself mostly. Oh, by yourself. Um, yeah, I started when I was about seven years old. Um, playing guitar, you know, stuff like um, Stevie Ray Vaughan, which was actually playing uh, most difficult. of the night. Yeah, Stevie Ray Vaughan, um, you know, Randy Rhodes. Um, I, I grew up playing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then um, my my circle of friends that, li you know, lived around here, we started a band called Humanist, and they were using seven and eight string guitars. And wow. I didn't own any of them, but I really wanted to be a part of the local music scene. And luckily enough, um, I had a five string bass lying around, and I had picked it up, and I started to treat it um, almost kind of like a guitar, but I, I really wanted to start getting into uh, playing bass, mm -hmm. and I had ended up leaving Humanist for um, a bunch of different reasons. You know, I was very busy at the time with school. Um, I wasn't sure really where things were going, and uh, like I said, you know, we had actually had a practice room at Backroom, uh, much like Seize Awake did at the time, and I knew Kevin from being at Backroom, and what ended up happening was when I left Humanist, um, oh, <laughs> when I had left Humanist, um, I think Kevin had gotten wind of it, and you know, we, I had talked to him for a little bit about it. And uh, shortly after, I guess Kevin had gotten in contact with Seize Awake and with Sean, who were at the time looking for a bassist, okay. and um, had passed my name along. And that was when Sean got involved, and it, he had hit me up on Facebook. And shortly after, I came in for a couple practice runs, uh, trying to learn some songs. And from there, we kind of got the ball rolling. And, and the rest is history. Yes. Is history. Yeah. <laughs> now we're here. How many times have you guys been on tour? We did a small, um, we, we haven't unfortunately done like an actual nationwide tour or anything like that, but we did a small East Coast, we've done a couple of small East Coast tours okay. down to Connecticut, Delaware, up in New York, up New York State and whatnot. So who are you leaving behind when you in, go on tour? In, what do you mean? Like you have families, yeah, significant yeah. Like, others. I got my, my, my uh, two brothers, uh, their kids, I have two little nieces, my dad. Mm -hmm. um, what about you? I have my girlfriend. I have um, my mother, who's actually um, she had a, a brain tumor when I was a little bit younger, um, so she's actually in a, in a home in Pennsylvania. So I try to see her as when I can. But uh, you know, like when we go on tour, when uh, when we're unfortunate, uh, it, it's unfortunate when like you know when we're not around. Those are the kind of things that um, I don't want. I don't. I don't want to say that it's it's unfortunate for us. You know, if we go out on tour and, and do what we love, we're having an absolute blast. But I think the trade-off really is just like anybody would, you know, go to work and, and have to deal with certain um, certain circumstances like that. I think really the trade-off to doing what you love in this specific circumstance is that, unfortunately, you have to leave a couple people behind. Yeah. And um, for me, it's my, my mother and my grandparents. Um, yeah. Everybody's supportive. Does it, does it help? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, uh, in you know, in the six or seven years that we've been doing this, um, our families have definitely been supportive. I mean, our one guitarist mom was out here tonight, and she's like, she comes to a lot of our shows. You know, that's cool. Uh, our our drummer, again, he's on tour, but like his parents always come out, and and it's 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 cool when you can have you know five guys in a band where all their families are supportive and cousins yeah. coming out and family members. You coming have out. to have that. Absolutely. I think if you don't have it, that's. Yeah, and not that really goes, and go that's anywhere. not even just coming out to, because some people can't make it to an event. You know, support is also either whether sharing stuff on social media, just spreading the word yeah. in, uh, in their that local areas. And you know that you still have a girlfriend to come back to, right? <laughs> oh back. yeah, my my girlfriend actually came out tonight, and I mean, you know, a lot of the times, um, I wouldn't say we we share a, a great deal of musical interest, but she absolutely supports me in yeah. in what I do and and what. I would like to do with my life and even if it means you know paying full price for a ticket just to come out and see us um she does that very That's often awesome. you know whether i can't tell you how many times i've done that it, it's it's a very important and i mean i thank her you know many times <laughs> over because i think a lot of what people don't realize is that it good music will take you far but it'll only take you so far and bands like you know the dillinger escape plan and and tooth grinder you know just to, to name a couple of recent ones they don't blow up without people behind them supporting mm -hmm. them and and people coming out and supporting 
at this level, this is where it begins. You know yes. what I mean? Every every band has has been here at some point for the mm -hmm. most part, and and that's an important thing to realize is that all every band has started somewhere, and without support, without people supporting musicians for doing what they love, then they'll, that is what is required to take them to the levels that you know bands come and we see them on national tours. That right. they started somewhere, and yeah. it, it's support. Everybody's really got to start at the beginning. So. Oh. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So I, I've, I see that you guys are, obviously you won four Battle of Bands. You get featured on Metal Injection, was it? Yes. Metal Injection, and there was another one, another bigger. Uh, it was Revolver. 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 So you got featured on them. You've you've played on Mayhem. You're playing with these bands. Uh, Azalea Dying, you know, Slip On, now Wolf and War. So what's what's the deal with like? Do you guys have any talks with the contracts? Do you have any any leads and stuff like that? Because I mean. I've never really seen a new uh, New Jersey band that I know that's got that much kind of like publicity. What's the deal with that? It's you know what metal is a very difficult genre to break in terms of you know major success. Like you know, I'm not I mean Metallica is obviously out there, but uh, mm -hmm. you know Slipknot. It's they say Slipknot and Metallica are like the last of the, the big bands like that. So I don't know. I think right now it's it's disturbed too. Well, disturbed. I mean they're I mean, like getting would huge. Would you consider them metal or are they? Like yeah, kind of they're like new metal-ish. Right. You know. But I guess my point is that. Um, it's 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 hard for a band on a local level because there's there's a lot of competition in this genre, yeah. and like you guys were discussing earlier, there's there's it's like a melting pot of different styles of the genre. Mm -hmm. So it's really what what record labels are looking for and what uh, representatives and agents and whatnot. And we've we've sent our press kit out and whatnot. And we've gotten responses. We've gotten on the radio and whatnot. It's just a matter of of of, of pushing on, keeping going, and and I mean too, there there is you know like Sean said, a lot of competition. Uh, but the music industry itself has been changing. It's been changing for the last, you know, 10, 20 years with the introduction of, of streaming. Um, with, you know, now uh, downloading is, is, a, is a huge part of, of um, album sales now. They're all digital. They're not physical copies of albums are not being sold that often anymore. Um, so I think a lot of that contributes to how not only the, you know, the, the music industry on the label side, is operating but on on how the music industry on the band side is operating as well so uh, we have sent our press kit out you know like sean said um we still are are looking around we're, we're trying to to hope but at the same time i don't think any of us really want to limit ourselves um to being only operable if a label comes to us and wants to sign us we really do want to do as much as we possibly can by ourselves we've always had that mentality where we want to only operate for us to make the music that we love and if somebody comes along and says hey we really like what you're doing and um, we want to, to help you do it and we can work out a contract with them I think that would be great but um, I don't think we're, we're not putting all of our, our metaphorical eggs in a basket in that sense. Would you be happy to stay where you are right now? I don't think that any of us could really say that we want to be exactly where we are right now in the sense that um, this is all that we have planned for the band. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're, we're all, I, I, I would hope that I could speak for everybody when I say that we're all happy with where we are in the sense that we are proud of the success that, that has come of what we've done. But at the Definitely. same time, at the same time, I, I think we all have a vision of the future that involves us doing as much as we possibly can. Okay. That was a very presidential answer. Yeah, he's a very yeah, that presidential. Was good. He follows politics a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so funny question. Speaking of presidents, which one are you voting for, Donald Trump or Hillary? You got to do that to us right now, don't you? You're going <laughs> to yes. do that to us? Or you could do neither. You could do neither. I'm going to say I'm pleading the you fifth. Uh, I'm pleading the fifth. I'm not shooting myself in the foot with this one. All right. Um, well, I'll give a little bit more of an elaborate answer than Sean. You could say, you could say who do you prefer. That doesn't mean you're necessarily going to vote for them. Listen, I think when it comes to this presidential election that it's a rough time in American politics. Um, I don't think that this election has done the American political system any kind of justice. I don't really have a preference in the sense that I'm very upset with the way the political discourse has been happening in this Who country. Who wouldn't be? <laughs> um, I, I can't in good conscience um, really get behind either candidate. And um, I think it's just really a shame that a large portion of America feels that way. Uh, at least that's, you know... You're right. 
It, it's a very... It is a large portion. We hear know, that a lot. I, I saw a quote the other day where somebody was saying, listen, I don't think that anybody really loves either one of the, these candidates. And I think it's Some just people a, love a little, either one of them way too much, but yes. I hear, your, I hear the yeah, point. Yeah, there is definitely. fanaticism on both sides, but I don't think that the current political discussion that we're having in America is healthy for anybody. And... Um, I tried to get into the current election, but the more that I learned about it and the more that I saw it progress, the more I just became a little bit disheartened as, as things went by. Um, you could say that I'm an idealist, you know, and most people say that cynics, that cynics are, are more, more or less just continuously disappointed idealists. But um, as far as who I'm, I would be voting for, I haven't really figured that out yet because I don't really in my heart believe that either candidate would do the justice to our country that I believe it should be done. Mm. So I still like a personal war that I'm kind of figuring out if I feel that either candidate should be really what I believe is what a true American president should be. Yeah, I think it's difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things where you have to really break down, as they always say, go to their website. Like they, you, you watch them both in the debates. They say, go to my website, check this out, check this out. The facts, check the check facts. Check out the facts. <laughs> What's, what are facts anymore? Is everything's just getting tossed around on social media. You just don't know what to believe. Or what, you know, I think the bottom line is, is we all know that we're down to these two, mm. and it's nothing's going to change that. And doesn't it suck though? It does suck. That you have my my point on the whole thing is why do you have to choose left and right or black, uh, red and blue do that's you really think people are black and white no it's I, that's what i understand how people can segregate themselves to i'm a republican or i'm a yeah. democrat i don't believe everything every either one of them wants to do so why should i choose a side you know well the interesting thing is in um and i'm not putting america down by any means i love this country but in a lot of other countries um european countries um Candidate, each party can run more than one candidate. You're not really just subject to one party and another party, and those are your two choices. Like pick the top five yeah, instead in, of two. In <laughs> countries like France, um, they have maybe six or seven different presidential candidates, and it's it's kind of more of a free for all than it is in this country, where um, a small portion of the country selects only one candidate per side, and those candidates go at each other on a, a national debate. But I think. Really, what what should be focused on is a lot of people misunderstand what the, the role of a president is. Mm -hmm. The president is our president, but Congress makes laws. Yeah. And I think really the the, um, the antidote to a lot of our political problems is people becoming involved and people becoming involved in the political process and realizing that their voice does have a chance to make a change. And that voting in elections at all levels of government is how to really bring about that change, not just caring about the presidential election when it comes on television and when it comes on Facebook and when a candidate says something that's outrageous or does something that's outrageous or we find out that a candidate did something outrageous. Caring about it at all levels of government and making yourself involved in midterm elections, Congress elections, representative elections at the state level, that's really how you bring about change. Not just realizing that the presidential election is around the corner and that Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton did something outrageous. Exactly. So actually, I want to end it, end it getting back to the, something that we didn't discuss, the new album, which yes. was out in May of 2016. Yeah, we put that out in And May. that was uh, Death of the Marrow. Death of the Marrow, So yes. how was the... Um, the reception bit on that one the reception has been great i mean we've been uh pushing it out pushing it out online pushing it out to friends people coming out a bunch of people bought it tonight um i think people are loving it we've done it we've done a lot of different things on it like there's a, a song that i'm on there with uh, our ex-guitarist uh it's an acoustic song that we wrote it's our first studio acoustic song there's a piano song with me singing on it is it um, more of a ballad or did it lead into like more heavier it's more of a ballad. It's mm -hmm. different. It's different for us. And I think uh, people are, are liking that because it's kind of a, it's a change, you know? It's not something we've played out live this year at all, but it's a change. Um, I think people are receiving it well. You know, we got the music video out for it or Song Loners, and people have shared it. It's got... Well, definitely a show like this will help sell records. Oh, now, what do you What do you use for the, you know, kind of distribution side? Do you use, like, CD Baby or... Uh, what's what's the site we have, we used? It's There's TuneCore, CD Baby. We it's either Tune like Core. one or the other, you know. Yeah, we use TuneCore, and basically they push it out to uh, all kinds of different outlets. Yeah, you know? it's on like iTunes. It's on like iTunes, the Last Spotify, FM. I, I kept seeing yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you feel like a lot of your sales is in person, like shows like this, or is it? on iTunes or streaming. Obviously streaming is a big thing now, so it's probably that, but. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a bunch of streaming. Um, I think it's it's definitely important for uh, to get in the flesh with people and mm -hmm. they do come out and 
if you put on a great performance, and, and that's exactly what it is, it's performance. Don't just go out there and play your music. You have to perform for people, you know? If they appreciate what you're doing and they like the sound, and they'll, they'll come over and you tell, like tonight. I said, come over and say hello. And, you know, we had a few sales. Uh, what's it called? Some people bought the album. As long as they like what they're hearing, they like what you're doing, they're going uh, to gonna buy it. And I think a lot of it goes back to what I said earlier about, you know, the music industry is changing. Um, album sales are important, but album sales as a percentage of overall revenue have been dropping. And I think what is really important, what is an artist's mainstay nowadays is, performance. is really the Man. live performance. And as much as we do pride ourselves in, in what we have accomplished in the studio and the album that we made and, and the final product that we have to show for it, I think what all of us really love doing and uh, what we pride ourselves even more is our stage performance, our live performance. And, and that's really why we're down in the studio, you know, between three or five days a week is, is really sitting down. And, and I uh, not just me, I think almost every member of this band is what you would consider a perfectionist. We really sit down and, and try to make and tune and fine tune pick our live performance out to be as best as it possibly can. And I think that's really what I feel should be uh, when it comes to go in and, and watch a band live. Um, when I go to see a band live, it, it's not so much them replicating what they have on their album as them putting on a show. And, and that's really what it is. It's a performance art. We're, being paid to go out and do something and perform and i feel like that should be as fine-tuned as possible now do you do anything because like you said it's, it's the music injury is changing do you do anything like diy for yourselves to kind of promote your band you do like youtube videos or in, like instructional videos anything like like you said streaming do you do like periscope stuff like that now facebook has you know facebook live we do you plan on doing that we actually i believe um had a live video for a couple of our sets. We we played at Dingbats um, and Clifton uh, a couple Great months place. ago. Great place, local one. Yeah. Yep, definitely local. Um, definitely a place that we've played a lot, and we've we definitely live streamed a video of our set there. Um, and I know Sean handles a lot of the social media accounts, and and he's been doing a lot of videos on there. Yeah, in terms of DIY, it's uh. It becomes, you know, essentially cost effective if you have, you know, luckily we have members in our band that can, you know, like myself, I, I can do Photoshop work. Mm -hmm. I edit videos. Anthony, uh, one, you know, guitarist of the band, he does uh, video editing and whatnot. So we can actually go on there and, and put out regular content for people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's important when it comes to DIY because if, if you don't have, you know, content, for, it's, if you go, when it, when it comes to social media, if you go on there, um, you look at all these sites, everyone's pushing out daily. It's, you know, photos it's of constantly cells. pumping, constant, yeah. Constant, constant, and like, it's it, it's almost like a competition in a news feed to, you know, catch someone's attention, you know? Yeah, so I, he retweeted mine and not yours, kind of thing. <laughs> so yeah, I, li I like to, and it's, and it's fun for me to sit behind a computer and, and edit and photos of us and edit videos and we like to throw it up on YouTube for people. It's fun. It's, yeah, I mean, nowadays, I think YouTube is, it's television. It's a form of television. Right. And it's funny, there's like a smaller group of people out there that supposedly say that they make a living off of just doing their music like that you know videos and instruction and package so yeah i mean i, th I really think nowadays there's a it's a disadvantage because record you know people aren't buying records but right. you have an advantage of selling yourself in a different way oh yeah that's i mean look a lot of the th that's, a, that's a big discussion in, in the metal realm is how the industry's changed and what you got to do to get yourself out there and like i said before about competition you know you're mentioning youtube and whatnot if if it's I don't know. What do you, what do you... I mean, yes, the music uh, the music industry has changed, like you said. But I do think the trade off is with the introduction of social media, bands now have ways that enable them to do stuff like DIY and in interact with people. Right, and and now uh, I think the beautiful thing about it is, well, yes, records might not be selling the way they used to. We can now, with our own hands make content and try to distribute it to as many people as we possibly can in and of ourselves we don't have to rely on a label for distributing power and you can contact a lot of people personally too so. oh yeah absolutely it definitely um enables a very intimate kind of uh relationship with the people who follow us and with our fans and i think that it, it's a beautiful thing that we have that at our, at our disposal at our disposal mm -hmm. um but at the same time it at just like social media is enabling us to do this it also at some 
level costs money. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, you definitely have to put money into advertising. Um, social media advertising is just like advertising in any other form where you have a product and you want it to reach an audience. You have to be willing to make that, um, I guess it, it, you could say it's an investment. Mm -hmm. You really have to be willing to make that investment and, and believe in your product and, and push it. And I think we're at a point where we really do believe that we have a product that is worth pushing and, and we're trying to push it on as many levels as we possibly can. But, you know, like Sean was saying, we there is a lot of noise. And what you have to do is, is break through the noise. Just like us, I'm sure there are hundreds of other bands at this level across the nation who are all trying to break through the noise. And you really have to take an aggressive stance and try to, to push content through all levels of social media in order to break through the noise that are the other hundreds of bands that are trying to do the same thing that you are mm -hmm. you know and hopefully we're, we're able to do that I, I know you mentioned that you had saw that one video of us outside back room and that is very reassuring to know that we are able to at least reach people who m might not have heard of us before yeah because if that video reached you Mm -hmm. then we know something we're doing is is working exactly <laughs> like the, the facebook ads you know they came up on my facebook and i'm like oh it's funny you know local band and now i'm seeing the name everywhere it's it's pretty good right it's pretty cool to see um cool and she disappeared so i guess you have any last questions uh, good. no cool. all right so the last thing is we ended the interview with a song of yours which uh any particular one you want to end with or one of our yeah songs? one of your songs yeah we we kind of play the oh, song for everyone um, to end it out yeah. triggered, triggered? We have a song called Trigger Disfigurement. Any, uh, oh, Trigger Disfigurement. I yes. was going to say any any tribute to In Flames, but you, you got more <laughs> to the title than just Trigger. So. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks for being on. Thank good you guys so much. We appreciate it. All right, thanks.